Stand by SOT1. Standing. Ten seconds. Ready, rolling. Ready, SOT1. Ready. In four, three, two, one. Roll in. From legendary Uncle Studios in beautiful Southern California, welcome to another edition of Work Comp Matters, the central location for you employees, you employers, and of course, we haven't forgotten about you damn independent contractors. And now, here's this week's edition of Work Comp Matters. It is January 14, 2022, 12 noon straight up. Welcome to another edition of Work Comp Matters. We are brought to you by mancavepodcasting.com. If you want to do your own podcast, all you have to do is talk anywhere in the world. All you need is a smartphone or a computer. We will manage, direct, produce, get that sucker streamed online, live, and then into the cloud forever. And if you're a little shy, that's okay. John and I were that way once before, many, many decades ago. (laughs) We've got over 600 podcasts in the tank. They're completely free, no obligation. Just go on to mancavepodcasting.com. It's available for you 24-7. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Appel. I'm joined by Mr. John. Oh, I'm in Southern California. I'm joined by Mr. John Scalia in Munich, Germany. And we hopefully have uh, news, current events, stories, maybe some answers for you employees, you employers. And of course, we haven't forgotten about you damn independent contractors. Stories in the news with no end in sight to pandemic life. Parents fight disruption, they say is the new normal. California hospitals are are issuing a dire warning John has a story on sewage indicates dramatic drop in Omicron levels in Santa Clara. I can't wait to hear that one. The Supreme Court halts COVID-19 vaccine rule for U.S. businesses. Thank goodness. But they did approve businesses uh, in health care. From the California Health Line, justices block brought. Oh, that, I just said that. Okay. Uh, President Biden expresses dismay as the Supreme Court blocks workplace vaccination. Uh, Sorry, Joe, uh, you know, deal with it. Um, More stories in the news. Los Angeles Times. An infant dies of COVID. Riverside County's youngest death from the virus from the Modesto Bee. Stanislaus sets a record for new COVID cases. From the Sacramento Bee, Elk Grove, COVID spike prompts concerns from city leaders. From Cap Radio, Omicron surge strains Sacramento. And also from Cap Radio, COVID-19 outbreaks at Sacramento County jails prompt emergency releases. Those stories and or more coming to you today from Work Comp Matters. But I'm going to start off, let's see, with our first uh, story. And that is California hospitals issue a dire warning. The state's hospital system is in danger of collapse as skyrocketing COVID cases push hospitals past their capabilities. The California Hospital Association warned yesterday Hospitals are expecting COVID positive patients to triple by the end of this month with admissions peaking into the next four to six weeks. The surge in infections and hospitalizations is expected to last through February. And, um, you know, it's interesting that they say admissions. Because many people go to the hospital, I know many people of going to the emergency room simply to get a COVID test, but you're not admitted. Officially, an admission to a hospital is not when you show up, is not when you fill your information in, is not when a doctor sees you, it's when you're admitted overnight. 
They give you a bed, they give you a room, and you have to spend the night over at the hospital. That is the official name of an admission. And we have spoken before on work comp matters uh, about, I got a little tongue tied there. Well, we've spoken about numbers and statistics. And when people are admitted to hospital for COVID, people die in the hospital of COVID just because they are diagnosed with COVID does not mean that COVID was the cause or the main cause. It could have been a contributing factor. It might have been the main cause, or you might just have been diagnosed with COVID and it wasn't the cause at all. So when I read this story, I have to seriously question the word admission. And I'm uh, that is a very short rant on my part. I, I don't know if John, you want to comment or, uh, but uh, my man, John Scalia, 40 to 45 years in California, workers' compensation, employment and labor law. Now he's out there in Munich, Germany, and he's living the socialist life. Hey, John, happy Friday. And the stage is yours, bud. Thanks. Well, the first, the first, the first story I have is, is actually dirty. Has Omicron crested in the Bay Area? Sewage samples seem to suggest so. If sewage from Santa Clara County is any indication, a hopeful trend for Omicron in the Bay Area may be on the horizon, even as hospitals prepare for a surge of patients that is not expected to crest for at least a few more weeks. The county's wastewater surveillance tool, which measures levels of COVID-19 genetic material in its sewage systems, has shown that levels of the virus peaked around January 6 and have fallen dramatically since then. The county's tool revealed similar curves among wastewater surveillance systems in Palo Alto, San Jose, Sunnyvale, and Gilroy, pointing to the possibility that the Bay Area may have already reached its most troubling ridge of Omicron infections. We didn't know that the data was going to be such a great metric for infection when we started, but it turns out that it is, said Stanford University professor Alexandria Bohm, who worked with Santa Clara County to track its sewage plant as part of the Sewer Coronavirus Alert Network project, which monitors COVID-19 infect infection across 11 wastewater treatment plants. Well, you know, as somebody, as we might have said when I was going to university, that's some good shit. Of course, when we said that, we were talking about something else. Steve? Uh, 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 holy shit. What did you just say? <laughs> I said, when I was in college, we would refer to some stuff as good shit. Of course, we were talking about Mary Jane, marijuana, you know. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's the phrase we used. Oh, oh, John. Oh shit. I, I must, my, my hearing must be going one more time. Shit. What did you say? <laughs> I said, and when I was going to college, if you want to talk about getting, getting some marijuana dope, you would say, I want to score some shit. How about that? Unbelievable. Um, uh, I'm shit. All I can say is shit. Um, ha. Next story on work comp matters. President Biden expressed dismay at the Supreme Court's decision yesterday to halt his administrative efforts to impose a requirement for coronavirus vaccines or testing on businesses with at least 100 workers. Quote, I am disappointed that the Supreme Court has chosen to block common sense life saving requirements for employees at large businesses that were grounded squarely in both science and the law, close quote, he said, adding he would still push companies to immunize their employees. Quote, the court has ruled, but that does not stop me from using my voice as president to advocate for employers to do the right thing, close quote. Uh, you know, we've spoken about this topic on Work Comp Matters before, and John has a story up next. But I just want to say, I have uh, been against federal mandates for employers uh, since the start of this. Uh, and 
that's all I can say. I, I, I am happy with the decision, John. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I don't think much of, uh, of you know, the, the president as a lawyer. Um, I, think, I don't think Biden was much of a lawyer, uh, and I don't think he would recognize anything legal anyway. He wasn't, uh, and, John, he wasn't much of a law school student either because he got caught and admitted he was plagiarizing someone else's test paper. But go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, he was he was a terrible student, even undergraduate. Uh, New York Times once published his transcript. It was all C's and D's. I don't know how he got into law school. I guess back then they were desperate. I don't know. Um, but but uh, he, you know, he, he's, I don't think he really understands just because I agree with him that the mandate was common sense. But, you know, unfortunately, common sense does not mean it's constitutional. <laughs> right. So, yes, John. Thank you for saying that. Please continue. Okay, this article is from AP. And Supreme Court halts, halts COVID-19 vaccine rule for U.S. businesses. The Supreme Court has stopped a major push by the Biden administration to boost the nation's COVID-19 vaccination rate, a requirement that employees at large businesses get a vaccine or test regularly and wear a mask on the job. At the same time, the court is allowing the administration to proceed with a vaccine mandate for most healthcare workers in the U.S. The court's orders Thursday came during a spike in coronavirus cases caused by the Omicron variant. The court's conservative majority concluded the administration overstepped its authority by seeking to impose the OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration's vaccine or test rule on U.S. businesses with at least 100 employees. More than 80 million people would have been affected, and OSHA had estimated that the rule would save 6,500 lives and prevent 250,000 hospitalizations over six months. And well, guess what? If they're ruling against smoking, it would prevent even more deaths. OSHA has never before imposed such a mandate, nor has Congress. Indeed, although Congress has enacted significant legislation addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, it has declined to enact any measure similar to what OSHA has promulgated here, the conservatives wrote in an unsigned opinion. You know, I'm not really sure why they would issue an unsigned opinion. What coward? I mean, that's just cowardly. In dissent, the court's three liberals argued that it was the court that was overreaching by substituting its judgment for that of health experts. Acting outside of its competence and without legal basis, the court displaces the judgments of the government officials. Given the responsibility to respond to workplace health emergencies, Justices Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor wrote in a joint dissent. At least they signed their names. Uh, anyway, that's that's the decision. Personally, I you know, basically on the legal on the legal issue to be decided, it was not whether or not it's a good idea to do this. That's not what was being decided. It's not even a, it's not even being decided whether or not it's it's necessary. The only thing that was being decided was does OSHA have the right to promulgate such a mandate? And the court conservatives said no. And personally, uh, you know, I think it's a close question. I have, you know, I personally didn't think they did it either. Uh, you know, and that doesn't mean they shouldn't have the right to do it, but I don't think they do. Steve. Uh, John, I want to ask you a question about this after the break. Um, you're dialed into Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by uh, mancavepodcasting.com. We've got over 600 shows in the tank, completely free, no obligation, 24-7 at your disposal. If you want to do your own podcast, 818-357-4120, we'll produce, manage, direct, get it streamed live, and in the cloud forever. Anywhere you are in the world, all you need is a smartphone uh, or a computer. John, you were talking about the Supreme Court's decision. What is the effective difference, if any, between a signed opinion and an unsigned opinion? Well, there isn't any. I mean, as the same, as long as it's a majority, it has the effect of being the rule of the law, uh, which is why I don't understand why they wouldn't have enough guts to put their names on. <laughs> it doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah, no, I hear you. Now, uh, do you have a story on the health care Supreme Court decision or no? Because I know the Supreme Court allowed that. Do you have a story on that? Because I wanted to ask a question about that. Uh, I, I, it would have been, it was further on in the story where it, so it, I think it mentioned they allowed the mandate insofar as it affects healthcare workers. 
Yes, I want I, I wanted to ask you if that was a unanimous opinion on the health care workers, if you know. No, I think they were split on that one, too. The conservatives voted against it, uh, but they were joined by Roberts, I believe, and Gorsuch, who joined to make a majority saying that the that the uh, mandate for healthcare workers to get vaccinated uh, was okay. So Roberts joined them and so did Gorsuch. Uh, gotcha. So, you know. gotcha, thank you very much. Um, as, we know, as we know, historically, <laughs> there's, there's almost no doubt where Alito is gonna vote, where Thomas is gonna vote, um, and, and apparently where Kavanaugh is going to vote, you know, those three votes are, you know, locked in. And also the, also the, the religious nutcase, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, there's no question where those four are going to vote. So when you have it, when you have a five, four saying that the mandate for the healthcare workers is okay, it's because Gorsuch joined them and Roberts, who clearly has the ability to be reasonable, also joined them. Thank you. My next story is from the AP, uh, Associated Press. Businesses react to ruling against a Biden vaccine mandate for companies that were waiting to hear from the U.S. Supreme Court before deciding whether to require vaccinations or regular coronavirus testing for workers. The next move is up to them. Many large corporations were silent yesterday uh, on yesterday's ruling by the high court to block a requirement that workers at businesses with at least 100 employees be fully vaccinated or else test regularly for COVID-19 and wear a mask on the job. Target's response was typical. The big retailer said it wanted to review the decision and how it will impact our team and business. John. The realities of getting COVID from the QK, KQED hosts who've been there, by the way, since you guys are in Southern California. KQED is the, uh, is the what we used to call the public education TV station uh, in, in, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's Chan, West Channel 9. When I was a kid, I don't know if it's still on 9. Okay, skip two. What are the symptoms of a breakthrough infection of COVID? What steps should I follow if I test positive? We used to think of breakthrough cases of COVID in vaccinated people as being relatively rare. But the rise of the Omicron variant has shown that's no longer the case. We know booster shots help raise your protection against Omicron, as public health officials urge everyone eligible for one to get one. We also know that being vaccinated still gives you greater protection against severe hospitalization and death. Still, when a breakthrough case happens, it can be easy to feel surprise and shock. Just ask three of our own KQED hosts. And the article goes on. There's a picture of all the hosts, okay? But here's my problem with all these kinds of articles, right? These are people in the media, and they're giving you their opinion about something they have undergone that's medical. So they are saying, I'm going to discuss my medical condition with you. Really? No, they're not. Because they're not going to tell you whether or not they have any pre-existing or comorbidities. And, and that's obviously important. I mean, one of the three hosts, they have their pictures on, and one of the three, uh, they have her, her headshot, and you can tell just from her headshot, she's at a minimum obese, maybe morbidly, but she's clearly obese. I mean, the point is, you know, if you are going to go ahead and you're going to give an opinion as to a health problem where we know comorbidities are important, and you are unwilling to discuss your own comorbidities, then you should just shut up. Steve. From CAP Radio, Omicron Surge Strain, Sacramento. Business owners are not the only ones overwhelmed and burdened by the latest COVID-19 surge. The current increase in cases, the sharpest uptick in Sacramento County since the start of the pandemic, has led to widespread absences, low morale, and fatigue in the major social sectors that meet our most basic needs. John. This is from the San Francisco Chronicle, and it's California labor leaders and legislators push for reviving expanded COVID-19 sick pay. For much of last year, working people in California could take up to two weeks paid time off if they or a family member were infected with COVID-19 or had to care for a loved one who caught the virus. But the state's federally funded COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave rule expired at the end of September without a replacement leaving some workers to decide between using regular sick or vacation time, or in some cases, showing up to work and potentially spreading the virus to put food on the table. 
Quote, having access to COVID sick leave helped nurses stay home while symptomatic, said Jeffrey Newgrid, a registered nurse in SoCal who said he tested positive for the virus this month and is using vacation time to get paid while he recovers in lieu of supplemental sick pay. Newgrid spoke during a call Thursday that saw workers, labor leaders, and state legislators call for the speedy passage of legislation that would revive the lapsed emergency sick leave. People who are exposed to the virus at work are also eligible to be paid to stay home under rules recently extended by state workplace safety regulator Cal OSHA that could be in effect until the end of the year. Uh, you know, I, I again, I'm, I always express uh, amazement that the, the most the richest country on earth has these really sort of really stone age rules regarding regarding sick time and, and leave from work when you're, you know, when you can't. I mean, of course, I am so old uh, that maternity, you know, forget about paternity leave, maternity leave did not exist when I was work, beginning, when I was in the workforce uh, in the beginning of years, years later, decades, you know, uh, and certainly paternity leave was unheard of. So things have gotten better, but they're still not where they should be. And they're still not up with the rest of the industrialized world. Steve. John, John, what was the uh, uh, publication you just read, please? Which publication? It was from the Chronicle. Uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, yes? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do the next one from Cal Matters along the same lines. Will COVID sick leave return to California? Labor unions and their Democratic allies in the legislature want to bring back extra paid sick leave for COVID-19. Governor Gavin Newsom, who I refer to affectionately as the GAV, is also proposing to review supplemental leave in his budget. But as with so much else in the pandemic, it's not a simple proposition. There's opposition from powerful business groups and key details of the leave still must be worked out, including whether companies get any help to offset their costs. John. Yeah, I'm going to sneak this one in. Uh, well, maybe I'm not because it doesn't look like I'm going to get access unless I want to subscribe to the SAC B. But I'm going to read. I'm going to read the head anyway. So the SAC B. Here's who gave to a COVID efforts at Gavin Newsom's behest. Six Flags and Facebook are among the private companies that donated to Governor Gavin Newsom's coronavirus response efforts in 2021, continuing an explosion in philanthropic giving to California governmental efforts that began in 2020. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the amount of money Newsom has solicited from companies and foundations for charitable or governmental purposes, so-called behested payments has skyrocketed. And the article goes on to detail the amount of money that Newsom has gotten from private businesses for his campaigns. I mean, for the campaigns involving you know, COVID, which are public service, of course. However, as it points out, all these businesses have very, lob very great interest in lobbying for certain legislation. And they've also given money to Newsom's campaign. They, they, they spent, they gave a fortune during his uh, opposition to the recall movement. Uh, so, and they're saying there's no indication that they're buying legislation, but here's the deal. When you give that kind of money to a candidate, what you're buying, you're not, you're not necessarily buying the candidate. You're not necessarily buying guaranteed endorsement of your legislation. But what you are buying is access. And as everybody knows, access is very, very important. It's 90% it's of the game. And so when you give that kind of money, you are going to have the governor's ear. And, you know, and so what you've got is you've got organizations like Facebook and, and you know, and other private organizations that are giving all this money to the to the state of California and to his fighting the recall campaign, and they now have the governor's ear. I, you know, that's not a good thing for democracy. Sorry, Steve. From the Washington Post, nor uh, nearly all teenagers in CDC back study needing intensive care for COVID nineteen were unvaccinated. Nearly all teenagers needing intensive care for COVID nineteen were unvaccinated in a study of more than 1,000 hospital patients in the United States. The Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine prevented 94% of hospitalizations and was 98% effective at keeping patients out of intensive care or from requiring life support 
per the peer-reviewed analysis published Wednesday in the New England Journal of Medicine. John. Hey, this is from Calamatters. Free tests as COVID surges, rapid results cost up to $300. When Rebecca Santucci of Lakewood learned that her sister Stacy may have been exposed to COVID-19, she set out to look for a rapid test. She needed to know quickly whether their 88-year-old father was at risk. Pharmacies had been wiped out of, of home test kits, and testing clinics were booked solid for at least two weeks. On Amazon, she found a set of two at-home tests for $38, but they wouldn't arrive until next month. And anything that required waiting hours in line wouldn't work for her sister, who has Down syndrome and anxiety. Eventually, she found a slot for a rapid antigen test at a private drive through clinic on the City of Lakewood's website. But it was five days after Stacy learned of her potential exposure. The price tag for the test, $129. We ended up paying the money, but it killed me to do it, Rebecca said. Stacy tested negative, so at least they finally got some peace of mind. With the explosion of the highly transmissible Omicron variant, more Californians find themselves seeking tests <clears throat> wherever they can find them. State and local testing sites offer free COVID-19 tests, but they are swamped, forcing people to seek private pop-up clinics. Quick results often come with a hefty, hefty upfront cost. Some clinics charge nearly $300 for a rapid PCR test, although state and federal regs require COVID tests to be free or covered by health insurance. People often have to pay up front, and the amount is unaffordable for many Californians. Um, you know, again, the funny thing is there was an article, there was a, 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 a easy for me to talk. There, there was a segment on Al Jazeera's news today about the COVID outbreak in Germany. We're having an Omicron thing ourselves, and the numbers, at least of the infections, are going up, while the hospitalizations are not that bad. And the biggest complaint about the testing in Germany was not that it's not available, but that the lines went around the block, which is true. I mean, the lines in my local area at the testing center are always, long. I see them, they're always long, uh, but they're there. And if you, if you can stand in line, you can get it. And there's free testing and it's available eventually if you're patient enough and if you can stand in line, or I suppose if you find the right time. Steve. Uh, this is my last story uh, today. President Joe Biden announced yesterday that the government will double to one billion the rapid at-home COVID-19 tests to be distributed free to Americans, along with high-quality masks, as he highlighted his efforts to surge resources to help the country weather the spike in coronavirus cases. Biden also announced that starting next week, 1,000 military medical personnel will begin deploying across the country to help overwhelmed medical facilities ease staff shortages due to the highly transmissible Omicron variant. Speaking at the White House, he said six additional military medical teams will be deployed to Michigan, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Ohio, and Rhode Island. What? No California? What are we? Chopped liver? John. Well, I, I don't think California has as much of a problem in terms of providing care as the rest of the country. California's medical system is, it's not socialized by any means, but it's probably the closest to a socialized system anywhere in the country. Um, but yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, Biden's Biden is, uh, I'm sure he's got typical East Coast biases when it comes to all that. Um, what can I say? <laughs> and, and, and John, unless you have any burning thoughts or closing desires, I'm going to end the show. Well, I would point out that, you know, on my, on my sports show with my son, which is coming up 15 minutes from now, we will be talking about COVID because we're going to be talking about Novak Djokovic. And what's going on in Australia with this an intersection of, of COVID law and law in general and uh, all kinds of things. So uh, if you've got, you can stay tuned for 15 minutes. Jamison and I will be talking about that. There you go. There you go. And that, of course, will be on mancavepodcasting.com. Got to give mucho thanks and props to uh, Scott Walton, legendary, un uh, ha! legendary Uncle Studios. My man, John Scalia in Munich, Germany, and all the good people back at Work Comp Matters, uh, pardon me, uh, mancavepodcasting.com. My name is Steve Appel. We'll see you again Monday, 12 noon, 
for another edition of Work Comp Matters. Bye, everybody.